what does being overwhelmed mean to you? You know, those that can type, type it into the chat box. You know, what does feeling overwhelmed actually mean to you? What does it look like? What, what is that feeling? Um, Cause I think it's quite a, until you actually stop and ask yourself, what does overwhelm mean? I think it's quite a sort of nebulous concept um, that we're gonna dive into today. But I just wondered personally what it means to, to some people. So pop something in the chat there. What does being overwhelmed mean to you? Can't decide what to do first. Oh, there's some great ones popping in here. Having so much to do that I can't focus on anything. Yeah, I think I think you've, you've hit the nail there really um, on the head. It is that sense of, um, it's more than stress, and, and I'll mention that in the slides. There's stress, which is, is bad enough, obviously, um, but overwhelm is a different beast, I think. It's a form of stress, and obviously we're usually under stress by the time we get overwhelmed, but it's slightly different in that sense of not even being able to decide what to do next. So we can be stressed, but we still sort of move on to the next thing and move on to the next thing. Um, whereas overwhelm is this, as I say, different beast whereby we just don't even know where to go next. We're sort of frozen. Um, somebody said, unable to cope with what we have to do. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting because that to me sounds like a feeling. And again, overwhelm, I think, is a feeling. Um, it's how we feel about things. That, that's that sense of overwhelm. Okay, so overcoming overwhelm. So what is overwhelm? So I came across this little quote that I thought summed it up quite well. And you've all mentioned this in the chat as well, that you have you have something to do and you just don't know where to start. Um, so as I've mentioned, I don't it's not the same thing as stress. There is stress and then there is overwhelm, which is, as I say, sort of almost the next step on from stress, if you like. And I think it's where we get to the point where it's not just that we've got a lot to do. It's, it's not just that we have a lot on our plate. There's there's more to it than that. And it is this emotional feeling. It's a feeling that it's all too much. Um, it's all mounting up. I, when I think of overwhelm, I very much think of a sense of pressure. There's, there's, this is like a pressure cooker. There's so much pressure on us. Um, and, and we don't feel as though we've got the coping tools, the emotional resilience to be able to get through it all. And I think that picks up on some of the comments in the chat box as well. So it's this feeling completely overwhelmed by everything that's on our plate. Um, so what actually is overwhelm? I always like when I'm talking about a certain topic to actually double check that we're all you know, on the same page. What are we talking about? What does it mean? And this is a definition that I thought was quite useful. So it's an emotional state, again, this emotional idea um, in which we may be struggling to cope with or to deal with our current situation, the situation that we find ourselves in. So indicators of overwhelm might be feelings of um, that we're feeling inundated, swamped, overloaded, overpowered, defeated. Again, all these words that sort of imply some, some pressure being under something, if, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and it's interesting that these feelings are usually accompanied by a feeling of volume. <coughs> feeling of simply that there's too much going on, um, too much going on to be able to cope with. Now that can be in a work sense, it can be work combined with home. It, it, it's, you know, when we're talking about overwhelm today, we're talking about everything. Um, you know, we're talking about everything that's on your plate, which, you know, now more than ever is a complete combination of both work and home. Um, so what I was gonna share with you now is, Sorry, when I let people in from the waiting room, it just freezes for a minute. Um, so what can overwhelm look like? So these are some of the, if you like, symptoms or behaviours that you might, be want, you, want, you might want to be on the lookout for, either in yourself or in team members that you work with or people that you look after. So again, this came up in the chat box, this sense of losing perspective, you know, when we're overwhelmed, just like when we're in sort of chronic stress state, we, we see what's in front of us. I mean, it can be literally the pile of papers on your desk, perhaps. Um, but we, we can't step back from that. We can't get past everything that's in front of us. Now, obviously, it's not just physically the papers that might be on the desk in front of us. It's all the, you know, I call it mind chatter. It's everything that's going on in our head. You know, it's the birthday cards we need to order or the food shop we need to sort out or the washing that needs to be done or, or a bill that needs to be paid on top of everything else um, that, that we've got on our plate work-wise. But we can't get past that. We can't see the bigger picture. So it is losing that sense of perspective. 
And of course, you might be feeling constantly tired because um, you might be working longer hours. You know, there's this sense of, of volume that we talked about, that there isn't enough hours in the day and there's too much to do. So it may be that you're not actually getting to sleep until very, very late. Or it may be that you might be going to bed, but you're not sleeping because of the, the feelings of stress and overwhelm, you know, are obviously impacting your sleep potentially. Um, if you get a sense that you might be overreacting to situations, you know, this, this sense of being emotional, maybe cold, highly strung, short tempered, that sort of thing. Um, if, if small things that you would normally cope quite well with tend to tip you over the edge, you know, if you feel that you're prone to, to mood swings more so than, you know, than, than you would normally be, it's out of character for you maybe. Um, this is an interesting one that you can't say no to something. And I don't mean this in a people pleaser sense, which is a, another whole issue with, with the legal profession, but in a sense that um, you struggle to evaluate what is important and what's not, and also struggle to evaluate priorities. So say you've got two competing clients with, with, the, with their matters and they're both shouting, saying, this is really important, it needs to be done. And when you're overwhelmed, you can't, again, it's, it's combined with that losing sense of perspective, you can't really evaluate whether that transaction is more important today than that transaction. So you sort of are saying yes to everything because you can't take that step back to understand what really needs to be done today versus what could wait until tomorrow. So again, everything feels urgent and that it must be done now. Um, you know, and it is that panicky sense of this all must be done now, but I don't know where to start. Um, and, and maybe you have this sense that everything is going to get better at some point. So, uh, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed now, but it will get better tomorrow. It will get better next week, next school term, next month. If you're in property like me, when the stamp duty deadline happens at the end of June, you know, there's always a it will get better. It will get better. But what's interesting about this one is I know one of my first coaches always said, if a situation has been this way for three months or more, this is your normal. Um, so when when you're looking at how how you've been feeling recently in terms of overwhelm, um, you know, if it is something that's been going on for three months or more, then there isn't necessarily a, you know, I can do this for a week. I can do this for a couple of weeks. I can do it till year end. We, we can do short bursts. Um, but what we can't do is a long term um, situation of feeling the same way. So if you look back and things have been that way for quite a long time, then, you know, it's it, it's not this It's just going to get better tomorrow or next month. That is that is your new normal, potentially. Um, again, maybe you have this sense of um, background fear. You know, there's always this what if, um, you know, what's going to go wrong if I don't do this right now? Um, what's going to happen? You know, again, losing sense of perspective. And then there's this sense of fear that comes with that. Um, linked to that is what I talk about quite a lot is this idea of catastrophic thoughts. You know, we think that everything is going to have dramatic consequences that are going to ruin our life or ruin our career. You know, it sounds melodramatic, but when we are um, in that state of overwhelm, that's why we're panicking, because we think everything is going to have these dramatic consequences if we don't um, deal with them and don't do them. So it is a huge sense of feeling out of control. I think that's the easiest way to sum up overwhelm is that we feel that we are out of control. And it, it's not necessarily about the reality of the situation, it's a feeling. But that feeling that we're not in control is what causes all these other issues to, to build up. Um, we, we struggle to delegate or ask others to do things because we fall into the trap of thinking it will be better, quicker and easier for us to do them. Um, and it all needs to be done right, which again, plays into that sense of we, we were trying to, to grab some control, if you if you like, to take back some control. And it, it taps into that fear sense, you know, something will go wrong if I don't do it myself, um, that, that sort of idea. And then, you know, your, your expectations of yourself, you know, which even in normal times for, for us lawyers can be very, very unrealistic. We can put far too much pressure and expectation on ourselves. But when we're in this sense of overwhelm, that just increases. We put even more pressure on ourselves, even more high expectations of ourselves. And really, if anyone else was to look at what we're trying to achieve, they would say that, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be pretty difficult, if not impossible. But we get, again, we lose that sense of perspective and we get stuck in it and think that that's what we need to be doing. Um, so what I was hoping to be able to do I don't think I can from here, let me just stop sharing a second, is launch a little poll for you. Um, 
but actually that isn't going to work thinking about it because you need to see the slide i'm new to using polls and you can see that i'm not very good at it yet so what i wanted to ask you was when having a look at that list which i will bring back up now how many of those feelings resonate with you um you know is it sort of one to three or four is it four to six or seven you know or is it up to you know up to the full 12 um that was that was the question that um that i wanted to ask you so you know maybe have a look at that feel free to pop a number into the chat box and we can certainly pick that up when we come back to the questions um so maybe it's actually going to let me run this oh yeah maybe it will now let's go back one there we are. Right. Hopefully now you can see a poll and you can see the list of um, overwhelmed symptoms. Let me launch that. So when you're thinking about the last month, how many of these sort of symptoms, um, this is anonymous, by the way, it will just give me numbers. Um, how many of these 12 symptoms here resonate with you? How many could you see in yourself in the last month? Um, you know, is it one to three, four to six, seven to nine, 10 to 12, all 12 and some. So yeah, can see those coming in. I didn't put a none option. I assumed somebody, everyone would have felt something for coming along to a session like this. Perhaps I should have put a none option as well. Yeah. Okay, so at the moment we've got the highest percentage four to six, but we've got some in everything. We've got a few at all 12 and more. Okay, so we're at the majority of us are at four to six and above. So let's close that down. Okay. So why do we need coping strategies? So overwhelm can hit us at any time. You might not be feeling in a state of overwhelm right now, which is fantastic, um, but hopefully these coping strategies are still gonna be useful for you when you start to feel that almost sort of slippery slope towards it. Um, these, these strategies will be useful for you um, because we do start to feel panicky when we start to feel ourselves either sliding into that feeling of overwhelm um, or sometimes we don't even realize it until we're right in it, um, but we can start to feel panicky um, and, and out of control as, as I've mentioned. I think, as I say, this is the biggest symptom really that we just feel everything is out of our control and importantly our rational and sensible thinking goes out the window and I think that that's the biggest problem with overwhelm is that as I say if anyone else sort of took a step back and had a look at things they might see things very differently to the way we do but because we are in this sense at this state of overwhelm we're not able to take that step back we're not able to take that perspective no. Um, so the rational, sensible thinking goes out the window and that's the time when we need some coping strategies. We want to be able to take um, calm steps that restore us back into control. So how can we get back into control again? Um, so uh, Tammy kindly introduced me. So, so that's me, um, commercial property lawyer, half the week because it's my own business, which is wonderful. I get to choose how much time I spend in it um, and about half the week um, coaching and training lawyers, which uh, I absolutely love to do. Um, I've got three boys myself. Um, they are 11, seven and three. Um, and where my sort of sense of overwhelm has come in at the early part of this year is um, that I'm being involved in, in writing a couple of books. So The Authentic Lawyer is, is my book and I'm co-authoring um, Future Proof Your Legal Career, which uh, is due to be published in August. And because it's being published, which is great, but does have those deadlines and things like that. So that's certainly where uh, some of those feelings of overwhelm have, have come in for me this year. So what we're going to do in today's session is I'm going to talk you through eight <coughs> steps, so an eight step process to handling these feelings of overwhelm. Um, so what is the first um, step in this process. Um, now I've got a guide that I can let you have afterwards so you don't need to worry too much about writing down all the steps. You'll be able to have that that will show you um, each of the eight steps but I'm going to talk you through them here. So the first step is to stop. 
So we find ourselves, um, you know, we, we realize, which I would say is half the battle, realization is half the battle. And then the, the next half is what are we going to do about it? But the biggest thing is to realize that we are in that state of overwhelm and, and to stop, stop trying to do everything, stop trying to jump from one matter to another, or shall I return phone calls or shall I look at emails or shall I draft documents or shall I take the dog for a walk or shall I go and get something to eat? You know, just stop. If you reach that point where you know you're looking at everything in front of you and you cannot make a decision on what to do next just first of all just stop don't try to keep carrying on with it um, and the second um, step in in this process if you like is to is to know that it is okay to know that other people feel like this too you know what I haven't done in in today's presentation because I didn't think there was any need for it is to have a slide about why we feel overwhelmed you know it is completely to be expected after the year that we've all had which has been unlike anything, of course, any of us have ever seen. Um, so, you know, there's no need to list the reasons why we might feel overwhelmed, but do know that it is completely normal. You know, this is how you're feeling and that is okay. It is not a time to be beating ourselves up, judging ourselves that we feel we're not good enough or we're getting it wrong and everyone else is coping and I'm not. Well, that's not the truth. You know, I can tell you, if you didn't know already, that everyone else is not coping fine, um, you know, uh, and um, so, so don't feel like that, you know, everyone is feeling the pressure in one way or another at the moment. And then another question to ask yourself is, is what would a kind friend say to you? You know, if you sat down with one of your close friends and sort of laid out everything that you've got on your plate, what would they say? You know, um, and they'd probably say something like, well, of course, you're feeling like this, you know, look at everything that you've got going on, look at the situation that, that you're in, you know, etc. It is about being kind to ourselves. You know, you can almost ask your, yourself the question, if I was talking to one of my friends and they said all this, what would I say to them? And you probably wouldn't say to them, well, you know, just pull your socks up and get on with it. Or, you know, why are you feeling like that? Joe Bloggs has got it worse than you, etc. You know, a kind friend, you wouldn't say that. And a kind friend wouldn't say that to you. But unfortunately, we're not always as kind to ourselves. So, so that's the first sort of couple of steps in this process is just stop. Don't keep trying to do everything um, and, and don't beat yourself up about it. Know that this is OK. And in fact, I'd go as far to say this is normal. Feelings like this right now are quite normal. So the next step in the process, um, what I didn't say there with stop and I would add to is when you stop, go and do something else for a little while, go and make a cup of tea or get yourself a glass of water or even just stand up and take a few deep breaths and then sit down again. You know, make do something that creates a break. So you've done the stop, you've done the, OK, this is how I'm feeling right now. Do something that sort of breaks the the thinking, if you like, break the thinking pattern. Um, and I also think there's, there's a lot of um, use in going to get some refreshments, because obviously, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you've probably run down on energy as well. So, you know, go and have a cup of tea, cup of coffee, water, you know, a snack, what, what, whatever it is you can you can get and then come back and do this part, um, the next part of the exercises. So the next thing to do is to dump it all out on a piece of paper. So get your notebook, um, your phone or your emails if you need to. I think there's a lot of power in writing. So I always recommend to people that they get a notebook. Um, dump it all down in a list. Now, this doesn't need to be a, a neat ordered list. You don't need to have a column that's work related and a column that's home related, not at this stage. This isn't emptying everything out of your head um, exercise. So just write them down in the order that they come to you. They might be big or small. They might be, you know, again, I'm a property lawyer, so reports on title, um, you know, whatever it is, sorting out invoices. It could be small things like, oh, you forgot to return that phone call or you make that doctor's appointment. Whatever they are, big or small tasks, everything that is weighing on your mind. I've used the term mind chatter already. You know, the mind chatter that's going on, all the things that you keep reminding yourself to do and then you're batting away again. Because I always say it takes so much energy to think of the thing and then bat it away again. That is using up valuable energy. So dump it all down on the piece of paper. The tasks, the decisions, the conversations you need to have, all of the things that are weighing on your mind, put them down. And as I've said there, don't overthink them. Don't judge them as too important because even that is using your energy. You know, and when we're overwhelmed, um, the, the amount of energy it takes is the same, whether it's a big decision or a small one. You know, we, I'm sure you can recognize that feeling where somebody says to you, oh, do, do you want a cup of tea? 
and you just can't decide. You just can't decide if you want one or not. Or when somebody says to you, you know, what should we have for tea? And you're just done. You, you, you've used up all your energy to get through the day and you cannot decide what you want to have for tea. You know, so just don't overthink these. Don't use up more energy. Just dump them all down on the piece of paper. So that's step three. Um, the next is step four. So look at your list and cross off anything on that list that is not urgent for the next two to three days. If it's not urgent in the immediate future, just cross it right off the list. And then next, cross anything off the list that will just naturally pop up again when it's needed. You don't really need to be carrying it. You don't need to be reminding yourself about it. It will naturally pop up when it's needed. So just cross that off the list as well. If you're honest with yourself, the next one is, is there anything on that list that will never really get done? It would be a nice to have, but it, if you're really honest right now with the time and the resources and the energy that you've got, that thing is not really going to get done. You know, and I, I use an example, one of my clients last year, she told me that she'd got a newly qualified solicitor in her team and she wanted to get a congratulations card for her. And it kept popping up on her mind, get that congratulations card, you know, order one, buy one when I'm in the shops, get that card. And actually, when she was having the conversation with me, the person had qualified four months before and she was still carrying around buy that card, buy that card. And, and you know, I said to her in the nicest possible way, let it go. It's very kind that you wanted to buy that card. The moment has gone. Cross that off your mental to do list. So, you know, you may have things like that, that they would be nice. But as I say, if you're honest, it's not going to happen. So stop carrying it around with you. Just cross it off the list. And then the final one is anything that will naturally take care of itself in time. If you don't do anything about it, it will not be the end of the world. You know, it, it will sort itself out. So cross those off the list as well. So hopefully by that point, you've got a slightly shorter list. The next step is to look at what you can delegate. So have a look at your list and decide, could someone else do it almost as well as you? They're not going to be able to do it as well as you, I'm sure, but could they do it almost as well as you? Um, and would it take less time for you to find someone else to do it than it would take you to do it? Um, that's not always the case. You know, sometimes it might take someone perhaps more junior than you a bit longer to do it, but maybe they've got more time and maybe they would use it as a training opportunity, which would be great and it would take it off your plate. If you assumed that everyone you asked would say yes to you, what would or could you hand over? Now, you're not handing anything over at this point. You're just looking at your list. So when you look at your list, if you assumed that everyone you approached to ask if you could delegate this to said yes, what would you hand over? Make a note of that on your list. And then finally, are there any other issues, concerns, any issues on that list that actually just having a conversation with someone might help you with? Is there just something that you're a bit stuck on or you are procrastinating over that actually having a chat with someone would help? Again, I know uh, another lady who said that, um, being a senior person in the team, she still needs to bounce ideas and, and problems on files and things um, around with somebody, but she can't do it with junior people in the team. She, she wants to do it with, with other senior people, but she's alone in her office and doesn't have anyone else to talk to. And actually she realized that that was stopping her from moving forward on those files, not being able to speak to somebody just to bounce some ideas off and strategy. And, you know, would you do it like this? And, you know, just talk it through with somebody she realized that was making her sit on things and not get on with them which was then of course adding to to her feeling overwhelmed because there was all these um you know problem files if you like that, that she wasn't looking at because she wasn't having a chat with somebody about them so you know it's it's the old saying isn't it problem shared is a problem halved and there's a lot of truth in that so is there anything on that list that if you just had the chance to have a chat with somebody about it would help you know maybe it would get it off the list completely or maybe it would just ease the pressure in relation to that aspect of the of the list. So the next step is to, again, take a breath here. That's what we'd be doing at step six and refocusing. So before we move on to the next step, we want to start thinking about the priorities on our list. 
because again, what happens with overwhelm, as we've said already, is that we lose um, perspective, we lose the ability to, to, to remember what our priorities are, to remember what's important. When we get into overwhelm, we get this tunnel vision where we just see what's in front of us and we really believe that everything is so important. It almost all has equal importance, it has to be done. But you know that's not the truth, it doesn't all have equal importance. And so just taking a little step back, you know, and maybe this is another moment to, to stand up, take a few deep breaths you know if you do yoga a couple of yoga stretches if you've got time you know can you step outside for a minute or two but just something again that sort of resets you and um, and and you can go to this refocus point what is actually important in your life right now what really deserves your attention and this can call for some tough decisions as i've said there because sometimes we say yes to a lot of things because we'd really like to do them you know um can be personal or work related there are things that we might really like to do but if we're honest with ourselves again can we do it right now or actually is it that thing that's tipping us over the edge you know I use the example um you know I, I spoke to you a moment ago about about my book now I started my book nearly two and a half years ago and there came a point about a year maybe a year and a half ago, where I had to put that down. I had to say, no, that is not the priority right now. As much as I'd love to get on with it, I don't have time or energy to do it right now. And something else, something has to go. And so that needs to be put on hold. And, and you know, it wasn't something I wanted to put on hold. But when I looked at it truthfully and honestly, that that was what needed to happen. As it turns out, it was the best thing anyway. I've got much more, um, you know, much greater stuff to put in it now. So, I, you know, everything does happen for a reason. But as I say, it does sometimes call for tough decisions. Are you spending some time and energy on something that really you perhaps need to let go um, to be able to get through the time that you're getting through right now? So the next point, point eight, is about prioritising. And this is sort of getting to the to the nitty gritty of it now, if you like. Um, so. You've crossed off a number of things from your list. Um, you've taken a step back to refocus and to understand what's important to you and what needs to be um, you know, front of mind for you, where your energy needs to go. So then I want you to go through each of the items that are left on your list. And next to each item, you're going to put an A, a B or a C. So the A items absolutely have to happen today. You know, before you close up for the for the evening or before you go to bed tonight, the A items absolutely have to happen today. Now, be honest with yourself, you know, ask yourself the question, does this really have to happen today? You know, maybe there's a deadline, whatever it is, that thing absolutely has to happen today. So that gets an A. The next um, lot of items um, that you'd put a B next to are the things that it would be nice if it happened today but it's not critical. It doesn't absolutely have to happen today, but, but it would be nice if you did it today. And then you've got the C's, which is could happen today, could happen tomorrow, or even the day after. Um, so you've then itemized everything on your list with an A, a B, or a C. And then the final step is that with all your A's, you'll then prioritize them. So which A absolutely has to happen first, that's your A1. Then what's gonna happen next, that's A2. A3, etc. And then you move on to your Bs. You'll have your the B that has to happen first. So that's B1, B2, B3. So then you will have your list and you'll have your order that you're going to do them in. And the reason that this is important is that when you are in that state of overwhelm, you just don't know where to go next. And that's what we've talked about. So this is a process that will just help you produce a list. And so then what you need to do next is, is not think. You don't need to think anymore about which one you're going to do. You've got a list. You're going to start at A1 and then you're going to do A2. So it doesn't need to use up any more of your energy to be able to decide what to do. You've got a list in front of you. So that's that's the idea. Um, that's the way to sort of use the guide to A, get some things off your list that don't need to be done. B, refocus and then C, actually create a list, a workable list that you can use to know which order to get through everything in. And then the sort of final piece, if you like, to the jigsaw, and I've touched on talking about energy quite a lot as we've gone through, because it is so important. When we're feeling overwhelmed, we're depleted in energy. 
you know, we are trying to do too much with too little resource and, and, and our energy is, is that resource. So what do you need to do to look after you to sort of maximize your energy? And I did, you know, I mentioned a couple of these as we went through and that's why at the, at the stop point, so the stop and the refocus point, I suggested those are great times to just get up from your desk you know, go and get a drink, maybe something to eat, because, you know, again, we need, um, you know, we need energy into the body. If we're overwhelmed and, and got a lot on our plate, there's a tendency to just keep working, you know, and not take that break. Um, but that, that is a, that's a mistake, in my opinion, because if you're just trying to power through, then you're not, you're not being effective anymore. Um, you know, you're not being productive, because you just don't, you know, your body is, um, I don't, I don't like to compare it to, you know, um, robots or motors, but our bodies need energy to keep going. And if we don't stop to refuel them, then we're going to struggle and it's going to take us longer to do everything because we are um, so depleted of energy. So what do you need to do to look after you? And, and this is something that when we're overwhelmed, believe it or not, we have to remind ourselves to do because we're in that tunnel focus, tunnel vision. We just see what's in front of us and the work that needs to be done, etc we do forget to stop and eat or get a drink or look out of the window or take a few deep breaths, you know, whatever it is that works for you. We forget to do that because we just think that the next thing and the next thing and the next thing is so important. So if, if, if nothing else, actually, from today's session, what I'd love you to do is just think about, um, you know, when you do find yourself in, in those sorts of situations where it is a bit panicky, it's starting to feel a little bit out of your control, what could you do to just take a little step back? You know, literally go and get yourself a drink, go and get something to eat. If it's look out the window, if you've got time to go for a little walk, fine. If you haven't, just a few deep breaths, something like that. So just remember that your basic needs are even more important than ever when we're talking about overwhelm. So the basic things like water, food, sleep, and anything else that, that works for you that, that you, you know, that you know works for you. For me, it's meditation. That's my thing. I wake up every morning, I do my meditation before I do anything else. You know, that's my thing that keeps me sane, that keeps me going. So maybe there's something for you. Maybe it is going for a run, going for a walk, um, listening to your favorite song, you know, whatever the thing is, what, what keeps you going, what makes you feel better. Just remember that it's so important to, to look after your basic needs and they so easily go out the window when we think that everything in front of us is so important you know I can catch up on sleep later I'll get something to eat later you know I haven't had a drink all day you know those things it's very easy to let them go out the window but then what we don't realize is that everything we're doing it's like walking through quicksand it's taking us longer to do we're spending more time drafting that document or you know reading that email than we need to because we're, we're so depleting energy so it's really important um you know, I used an example um, years ago when I was sort of um, in, in a sort of very chronic stress situation, which is how I got into all of this work. I remember my mum sending me a text just saying, have you had anything to eat today? And I'm still so grateful to her for, for doing that because I hadn't. I was just, again, so in what I needed to do and worried about what I needed to do that I didn't even stop to, to think about eating. And I literally went and got a bowl of cornflakes. And I can't tell you, even five or six years later, I still remember how much better I felt after eating that bowl of cornflakes. So um, I, I have to say that there's a lot of truth in just making sure that you've stopped to, to recharge and to, to put some energy back in. Um, so if you would like a copy of my overwhelm guide that just has those eight points in there for you so that you don't need to have um, been writing them down, you can just print that off. Um, some of my clients just have it sat next to their desk. So when they know those feelings are coming back, they can just uh, pull that out and, and go through the steps. Um, so you can find that at authenticallyspeaking.co.uk slash overwhelm. Um, and I can email Tammy a copy as well that she can send out to people if you would like. So let me stop sharing now and see what questions, comments, thoughts, you know, does any of that resonate with you? Um, what do you do to, to help with feelings of overwhelm? Let me know and feel free. You can come on camera, you can unmute or you can pop them in the chat box. Do I think that people will experience overwhelm more as restrictions lift? That is a brilliant question. And yes, I do actually. Um, 
I think, I think in some respects, we've all got used to the pressure that we're under right now. We've been under it for a year. And although it's not easy, I'm not saying it's easy. People are under chronic stress, they're under pressure, but it's sort of become what they're used to. And I think as we go out into, you know, we all hate to use it, but new normal, new whatever it looks like, um, there's going to have to be a readjustment period and, and people are going to have to readjust. It is going to be new. It is going to be different. And there's so much, um, again, pressure. I use the word pressure because that's what I always think of when I think of overwhelm. There's so much pressure that is going to come with that, you know, whether it's people who are worried about commuting again or worried about being in office spaces or, um, I mean, ironically, isn't this going to be funny that, when you're working at home and you're working remotely, you can actually almost fit more in. You know, there's so many studies that show that productivity has increased while we've been working at home. Now, I know that has its downsides. It means people don't have good boundaries. They're not switching off at night, things like that. But, you know, when you can have Zoom meetings, you can have one after the other. Whereas if they're physical meetings, you've got to go to that meeting and then you need a bit more time and then you're going to the next meeting and things. Um, so it, it, it's going to be all that period of readjusting again. You know, in some respects, people are not going to be able to get as much done in the day as they could at home when they're back in the office. So I do think and, and I think, you know, I, I do say to people, be be aware of the fact that there is going to be elements of, you know, even post-traumatic stress as we move from where we are now to, to whatever we go into next. You know, it's going to affect some people, I think, um, which will, will increase overwhelm. For some people, the complete opposite. For some people that, you know, they're very keen to get back into the office, um, you know, whether it's going to be full time or two or three days a week. And and even that will give them some respite from overwhelm because they'll have the commute again, whether it's a walk or a train or a drive or whatever, they will have that space again that perhaps they haven't had at home. So for some people, it, it will reduce, I would think. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it's worth being on the lookout for. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think we experienced it as we went into lockdown and a change in circumstance. So it's like a just a, a cycle coming out the other end. Yeah, it is. I mean, because it's, it's a build up of pressure as well, isn't it? You know, like you say, we, we, we went into lockdown, it built up and then there's all these feelings of overwhelm. And then, you know, potentially we'll we'll have the same maybe as as we get back. Um, I'd say not for everyone. For some people, it'll be a, it'll be a release of the pressure. Oh. It'll be, um, it will work for them. Um, somebody said overwhelm is a symptom of anxiety. Yes. I mean, they're all linked as I say chronic stress, anxiety, depression, overwhelm, you know, you can't in many respects, symptoms of each are very, very similar. You know, they, they do overlap um, and one can lead to the other. You know, you're not going to be feeling overwhelmed unless you're under stress. You know, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, but as I say, the, 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 the differentiating factor I see with overwhelm is the freezing, the being frozen, the indecision, the not able to move forward, the analysis paralysis, as we'd call it in coaching, because we're looking at every single option and we just don't know what to do. We do not know which one to take. And so we're frozen. And I think that's the that's the differentiating factor with overwhelm. Good. Yeah. Anybody got any other questions? Or oh, how do you how do you do it if you have somebody in your life, work or personal, that they do not appreciate when you are overwhelmed? How do you deal with such a situation? Well, I suppose my starting point that might not sound helpful, but it is the truth, is that you can't change others. You can only change yourself. That's the, the place we all have to start from. Um, but that's not to say that you can't have conversations with people. And I think um, maybe even more so in a personal capacity than, than a work one, we can sometimes assume that people know how we feel. You know, especially if we're going through, say, the mood swings or the irritability, some of the symptoms we talked about with overwhelm. You know, if we're going through something like that and stomping around the house, we sort of think, well, they can clearly tell that I'm overwhelmed. You know, surely they can tell I'm dashing from one Zoom meeting to another. I'm barely managing to make it downstairs to make a cup of coffee between meetings. Surely they can tell I'm overwhelmed. And that's where we do make a mistake because we shouldn't assume anybody knows that what we're going through um, because you know they may be somebody who is not overwhelmed they may be flying around from one meeting to another and having the time of their lives perhaps I don't know but you know they may not in just what they see from us 
understand that we're overwhelmed. So it's always worth trying to have that conversation, whether it's personal or work, just to say, you know, and obviously at work, it, it's different, but I do, you know, that's where the authentic lawyer piece comes from. I do always try to say to people, you know, be honest with people to the extent that you can, to the extent that you trust people, make them aware of how you're feeling. Um, you know, because there's so many issues for, for law firms with, with things like overwhelm, chronic stress, you know, people do need to know how you're feeling so that they can support you um, just as you would want to if it was, if it was somebody else. So it's finding a way to have that conversation, I think, only sharing what you're comfortable with to the level that you're comfortable about sharing it. And it's worth, sounds silly, but it's worth practicing that conversation. You know, how am I going to say to that person, actually, I could do with a little bit more support or a little bit more understanding, not in an accusatory way. Goodness, we could talk about conversations the whole session, but not in an accusatory, you've let me down already sort of way, but just in a, you know, I could do with your help difficult for us lawyers to do that say reach out and say I could do with your help but really so important I mean you know these these feelings of overwhelm we we, we do we need somebody else's help um, and there is absolutely no um, you know no failure in reaching out and saying I could do with your help or support or even just your understanding that that's that's how I'm feeling right now um, so yeah I would, would try and have the conversation. Um, living on your own and working from home, what would you recommend to manage work boundaries, re-preserving work-life balance and feelings of isolation when there is a lack of in-person colleague support? Yeah. Um, okay, so I think there's sort of potentially two questions there. One about boundaries. Um, uh, I've got a resource on boundaries, which you're very welcome to find on, on, on my website. Um, but it, what my biggest thing about boundaries is, um, again, I mentioned it in, in the process at the stop and at the refocus. I, I talk about them as being bridging rituals. So a stop, putting a stop on what you're doing right now and in your mind, creating a gap before you go on to the next thing. So and this is really important in creating boundaries at home, um, maybe even more so important if you are living on your own. So when you finish work and that's your stop, so you've decided six o'clock, seven o'clock, whatever. And I would personally make that decision. You know, you might, it might be when a meeting finishes or when you've got through the urgent things for that day, you know, you make a decision. This is the time I'm stopping work tonight and put that, close the laptop down, put the papers away, you know, ideally not answering work calls and emails and things like that after that time, have a hard stop. Obviously only you can decide when that hard stop is, but make that decision, have that hard stop um, and, and have a ritual. As I say, what do you do that shows you've moved from work mode to home mode? And for me, that would be shutting the laptop down, putting the papers, you know, wherever, um, you know, but it can be, it can be bigger things. Some people are mimicking their commute. So they're going for a quick walk to the end of the road and back to say, you know, I've finished work. Um, again, it could be that you have a different flavored cup of tea you know, sounds silly, but it's about training our mind. We want our mind to know that we've finished work now because that's one way we can sort of relieve the pressure that we've talked about with overwhelm. There's a buildup of pressure because we're always on. We're always switched on and we need to sort of tell the body and the brain that we've switched off. So anything that works for you, and there's so many things you could try, as I say, having a different flavoured cup of tea, putting a song on that you love, you know, you could... Uh, Greatest Showman is mine. If, if you ever see any of my posts, I'm all about The Greatest Showman. That's how I start my day for a walk with The Greatest Showman really loudly. Maybe you have a song that starts your day. Maybe you have a song that finishes your day. You know, you can make it fun as well. Um, but have those bridging rituals. That's my top tip for boundaries. Um, and in terms of isolation and, and getting that in-person um, support, which is so important, and it's only fairly recently in some research I did that I realized how important this support is to feelings of stress and overwhelm. So I highlighted it with the story I said of the, the senior lawyer who was procrastinating and had, I forget the term she used, but we, you know, we, we know them as problem files or there's all sorts of terms for that file that you know is terrible and you just can't bring yourself to look at. You know, and, and she realized that it's because she needed to talk to somebody about that file. And that's why she was sitting on it and procrastinating over it. So what I've realized I hadn't known before is that there's so much pressure release in having those conversations with people on a similar level to you that you can just bounce ideas 
ideas off and you can, you know, share a strategy or just ask a question or even just let off steam. You know, the client has spoken to me like this or the other side has done this, whatever it is. So create those opportunities. I mean, everyone, but especially if you are working on your own at home and, and you just need to have that way to let off steam. You know, do you, um, you know, is there somebody else who you get on really well with who you could say, well, you know, once a week, could we have a half an hour Zoom coffee or or is it going to be more ad hoc than that? And you just drop them a message and say, I've got something I could really do with having a chat with you about when you're free. You know, just look for those, create those opportunities to, you know, because I'm sure they would be glad to have the opportunity to let off steam with you as well. So it would be a two way thing. Um, but yeah, bri brilliant question. And I say it's something even I, I'd not appreciated the importance of until this year, the ability for people to just, you know, what we do in the office is just lift our head above the little barrier or whatever it is and say, oh, what do you think about this? Or, oh, I've had this email. Can you believe it? You know, those little, little things that really do make a difference to people's stress and overwhelm levels that we, we didn't realize before. So great question. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the end of the recording if you have any questions coming out of the session please do get in touch <laughs>